All right. So I'm going to try to, to give a greeting in Swahili. I've never done this before. So I'm probably going to sound like a two-year-old, but Jumbo. Habare za mekhana? Like a two-year-old, okay. Gina Languni, Troy. Blessed to be here with you. Um, I'm looking forward to what the Lord is going to do in your heart and in your life. I believe that God has something for you. I believe God has something for me. I believe the Lord has something for all of us. And as we fellowship, as we worship the Lord, as we pray, as we, we study the Word of God, our Lord is going to show up. Amen. Because that's what He does. He walks in the midst of the lampstand, His church. He loves you. He loves the ministry that you are serving in. He wants to encourage you. And so I look forward to being able to do this with you. Um, and I'm going, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2 in just a moment. So if you want to turn over there, you can. But I'm here with my wife, Rebecca. We've been married for 36 years. We have three children, seven grandchildren, and they're all walking with the Lord. And we thank Jesus for that. I love teaching the Bible. Um, 30 years ago, we moved to Virginia, and we began to meet with a small group of people just to feed them the word. Um, I think it's in the front of your book. There's a, isn't there like a picture of uh, Chuck Smith in the front of the, there? So this is the church that uh, my wife and myself, this is where we met, this is where we got married, this is where I was ordained, this is where we were sent out. And um, Pastor Chuck used to encourage us as pastors is that as you go, whatever city you go to, whatever village you go to, make certain that those people are the best love best fed people in that town. And we can do that with the word of God. We can do that with the love of Christ in our life and the gifts that he gives to us. And so this is what we've been doing for the last 30 years is trying to make those believers there in our town the best fed, the best loved. And I want to share some things from you from the word of God that I think is going to be helpful in you doing this. If you're not a pastor, this message is really designed for you. If you're not a, uh, necessarily someone that teaches the Bible, what I hope can happen here in this message is that when you hear of the power of the Word of God and what it can do in your life, you will want to get the Word of God into you. And I realize that some of you are like, man, I, I just have a, such a hard time, you know, understanding the Bible and reading it and studying it on my own. At the end of this study, um, we're going to go over something. Actually, all of you should have got something that looks like this in your book. And then on the back, there's some questions. And then we do this at our church all the time with our, uh, the people that come to disciple them and to help them learn how to have a Bible study. And I, I hope more than anything else, that will become your best friend as you just read through the Word and begin to meditate upon it. But I want to pray first. So let's pray and ask the Lord to be here in this session. Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you, Lord, that you have not left us in the dark. We're not trying to figure things out because you have spoken to us and you've given us the scriptures. Lord, as we open our mind and our eyes uh, to your word, we pray that you will speak to us, that we will hear what you have to say. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay, so 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted, the Lord is gracious. So the title of this Bible study is The Priority of God's Word. The Priority. These three short verses are going to tell us how we can grow. And I hope, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're here. You've come to a conference that's about loving the Bible. I'm assuming that you want to grow in your walk with Jesus Christ, that you want to be closer to him. You want to hear his voice better. You want to know his character and his love more in your life. And, and this is how you do it. We're told in scripture how we grow. It should be a goal and a desire of every believer to be closer to Jesus by the end of the year than I was at the beginning of the year. 
I ought to know his word better. I ought to know his ways better. I ought to see the fruit of the spirit of my life more you know, at the end of the year than I did at the beginning. I ought to be more loving. I ought to be more kind. I ought to be more generous. I ought to be more forgiving. I, might, I should be more full of the spirit. We want to grow. And this passage tells us how to grow. You know, there are certain things in this life that certain individuals will have. Maybe they have great talent, or they have a great intellect. Maybe they're a great athlete, or they're a great musician. And you look, you're like, man, I don't really have that. I mean, I might be able to do a little of this, a little of that, but I'm not great at it. I'll never be a great fill-in-the-blank. But you know what nobody can keep you from being? A great follower of Jesus Christ. You can do that. Because everything that you need and I need to grow close to Jesus Christ has already been given. He's given us forgiveness. He's given us his spirit and he has given us his word. And guess what else he's given us? Each other. He's given us each other that we can grow and exhort and love one another. So this is this study. And the first thing that we read there in verse 1 is before we're going to grow... We have to take something out of our life. If you want to grow in Jesus, then you have to take the things that are hindering the growth. If you were, had planted a garden and you weren't getting enough shade on that garden because you had, this tree grew up really large and you're not getting enough sun on that, you've got to, hinder, you've got to cut down. You've got to remove that which is hindering the growth. And this can be applied in so many different areas of our life. And just in a physical way, right? Well, spiritually speaking, there are things that are going to keep us from growing and being more mature. And I guess I should just say right from the beginning here, is when I say that we want to grow and be more mature, think of it like this. I want to look more like Jesus. I want to be more like him. That's what it means to grow. Not that I'm going to become God, of course not, but that I'm going to be more like him. He has called us to be holy for he is holy. So this is what this portion is talking about. And he gives us a list of a few things that need to be removed if we're going to grow. Got to have things that are in our life that we have to repent of. We have attitudes. We have uh, actions maybe that, that are currently going on in our life. And you're like, I do want to grow. I do want to get close to Jesus. Then you're going to probably have to chop down that tree so that the sun can just shine upon your life. And so we read, first of all, that one of the things that needs to be removed from our life is malice. Malice. Malice is hurting people with words. It's damaging people. It's, just, it's a word that kind of actually carries a whole uh, uh, broad definition of evil and wickedness. It's, it's being a bad person. And so we shouldn't be bad people. We've been born again, right? If you back up into chapter 1, verse 22, you read, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. And he goes on, and, and he comes to the concluding thought there in verse 1. Since you've purified your souls, therefore lay aside these things. Because you are born again. Because you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel has come in and has changed you and has transformed you. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's a moving force. It's a powerful force. It is the most powerful force that any human being can ever come in contact with. It's the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. It can forgive our sins. It can take us from the kingdom of darkness and translate us into the kingdom of light. And we forever will be in the presence of the Lord. That's power. The gospel is the power of God into salvation. So because you've received this, now remove all of these things. Don't hurt people with your words. The next thing he says is that you need to lay aside deceit like a dirty garment. Maybe you've been out in the field all day. You've been working. You're sweaty. You're muddy. And you're coming in the house and you're like, I've got to change these clothes before I go to my neighbor's house, before I go to this special dinner or wherever it might be. You take those dirty garments and you lay them aside and you put something else on clean. That's the picture here. 
There are things that soil the robes of righteousness we've been given in Christ Jesus, and these things need to be laid aside. So the first one is malice. You, you're mean-spirited. You're, you're not a nice person. You, you hurt people. You trample people. And you feel justified in all of that. Well, he says, you need to take that dirty, filthy garment off and you need to lay that aside because we are the people that are to love the brethren. Of all people on planet Earth, it doesn't matter whether you're Kenyan, it doesn't matter whether you're American, we of all people ought to do love better than anybody else. That's a, that, this is like our calling because the Lord loves us. And so we ought to be able to love one another. And Jesus said, what? You, everybody's going to know, the world's going to know that you are my disciples because why? Because we love one another. So being mean-spirited, or the, the next word is deceit. And that's, that's taking advantage of somebody. It's, it's using trickery to get an advantage over a person. It's underhanded methods. You may say, well, listen, if they're not smart enough to know that I was tricking them, then they kind of owe me uh, a thank you because I'm teaching them a valuable lesson. Because if I don't teach them that lesson, somebody else is going to. So, you know, we maybe had an agreement, you know, that I would do this kind of work or I would, would help out in this way. But you know what? They should have known that I couldn't do that. So it's their fault. No, it's your fault. It's my fault. When we deceive people, we are to be people that are honest. He says to lay aside hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is pretending to be one thing and actually you're something else. This is not, you know, I'll, here's what hypocrisy is not. Hypocrisy is not loving Jesus, falling in sin, repenting of it, and telling other people to pray for you. That's not hypocrisy. That's just, that's who we are. We're a work in progress. But hypocrisy falls in the same sin and condemns other people for that sin and pretends like you're okay. This word for hypocrisy, back when it was first used, it was used to people that would be on a stage and they would wear a mask and that mask was to portray the character of whatever drama or play they were uh, involved with. And so they would put that mask on. That's where this word hypocrisy comes from. You're acting like somebody else. But we shouldn't be like that. Well, there should be an openness. There should be an honesty about us. He said that we shouldn't have envy within us. We shouldn't want what somebody else wants and be willing to hurt them to get it. We would never do that. We would never take advantage of somebody to get what they have. We wouldn't allow ill will to develop in our heart and our mind towards that sister or towards that brother because they, they got some blessing in their life. And he says, don't allow this kind of envy to come in or evil speaking. You talk about a brother or you talk about a sister and when that conversation is over, the person you talk to now thinks less of that man or that woman because of what you said. But you know, the reality is we don't even have to use words, do we? To speak bad about somebody. Somebody's name comes up. Hey, did you, 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 do you know Troy? Yeah, I know him. Did I say anything bad about Troy? No, but I know you don't think good about him because you just, you expressed something. And he says that all evil speaking should be put away with. We should not be tearing one another down. We should be edifying our, uh, one another. That is building each other up. And the word of God says that if we cannot say things that will edify, then just be quiet. Maybe there needs to be more silence. I don't know. But you want to know what will stop evil speaking? Is us not listening to it. And when somebody comes and says, hey, I need to tell you about so-and-so, say, time out. Have you talked to them about it? Well, no. Well, you need to talk to them about that. Because if you talk about them, then this is going to spread gossip. And I don't want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of building people up. I want to be a part of there being unity. And so he says, you need to lay these things aside. But you know, here's the interesting thing. And this is just a short list. There might, there, we can make a much longer list, couldn't we? Of things that we should lay aside. But here's the, here's the thing. 
We justify ourselves for those things that we do wrong so often. We find an excuse for it. We, be, we pretend like, well, you know, yeah, I said that bad thing about her, but you know what? She had it coming. If you knew the things that she said to me, then you would understand why I'm talking about her. And we begin to find excuses and justifications for why we talk evil about other people or why I take advantage of them. They took advantage of me. Now it's my turn to take advantage of them. And we use justification. You want to know who else used justification in Scripture? Judas. Ju you know, we don't read it specifically but you know that Judas was justifying his thievery. You know, he had that pocket, you know, or that purse that had all the money in it. And as things were going on, well, the Bible even tells us he used to take money from that. He was a thief. But you know, did he start out as a thief? Or did he, over time, did he begin to justify himself? Oh, man following Jesus around. I'm missing opportunities. And there he has his hand on that money and he pulls out a coin and he looks at it and says, I could take this thing. I could go get me a good meal. Nobody's going to know. I'm the treasurer. And says, ah, that would be wrong. And he puts the coin back in his pocket. He's not going to do that. But you know, another day comes along. He's like, man, that meal sure would have been nice. And after all, I'm working harder than any of these other disciples. I stay up late counting the money. I go out and buy the food. I think I actually deserve a raise. And he pulls out that coin again, and maybe even makes it all the way down to the market. And he's ready to buy that item, but he's like, ah, I can't do that. But he's playing with it, isn't he? He's justifying things in his mind. It goes back in his pocket, but the next time he goes to grab that coin, now something happened. In the, among the brothers, among the disciples, they were fighting, they were arguing, somebody did something stupid, probably Peter, probably Peter, right? He's the one that did something, and it's like, oh, I just can't live with these people. And he decides, I'm going to go buy that new garment. Nobody's going to know, I'm going to go buy it. And he takes that coin, and he, and he pays off. And now he's crossed the line. He's justified himself while he's been engaged in this sin. And maybe, I don't know, maybe you're justifying an ungodly relationship with a man or a woman. Maybe you're justifying taking something that's not yours because nobody's recognized you, because people around you are doing it. And you find, we find reasons to justify ourselves why we won't remove the filthy garment. But you know what? When I stand before Jesus Christ and I have to give an account for my life and how I lived it, all of my excuses are not going to feel very good in my mouth, are they? They're going to feel terrible. And so we have to be mindful. You know, and eventually Judas kept reaching in. He kept reaching in. It was easier and easier to go in and buy the mill, get his sandals fixed with the, the money that was coming in for ministry. And he began to steal. And then one day he had stolen so much and his heart became so heavy that when it, opportunity came for him to get 30 pieces of silver for Jesus, he took it. He had conditioned his heart to do that. It didn't happen in one instant. I, I believe it was something that happened over time. And you can imagine the excuses and the justifications. I left everything to follow Jesus. And look at how I'm living. I'm sleeping on the dirt. That's not fair. That's, I deserve better. And he crossed that line. Don't make excuses for the things that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God condemn in your life. What do we do? What do we do? We repent. We run to Jesus. And we, we get rid of these things in our life. We don't hold on to them. So... If you're going to grow in your walk with Jesus Christ, you first got to remove the things that are filthy. You got to take those garments off so the word of God can have an impact upon your life. So we move into verse two. He says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow by. The word is to be longed for like a newborn baby. You don't have to teach babies to want milk. The only time that would ever be the case is if there's something wrong with that baby. But a normal, healthy baby is going to want the mother's milk. And you know what? They let you know with everything they have, don't they? That might be a little baby just like this big. 
but they will scream and they will turn red and they will stiffen their bodies and they don't care what time of day it is. They don't care what time of night it is. It might be 2 a.m. in the morning and the baby begins to cry. He or she wants to eat. They are craving the mother's milk. That is the kind of desire that Peter says we should have for the word of God. It's intense. We, we feel it. I've got to be fed. I've got to be, you know, uh, taken care of. Now, you can pretend, dads, you can pretend like you don't hear the baby at 3 a.m. in the morning. When that baby's crying, you're like, well, I'll let her get the baby. It's like, no, you hear that baby, and you're acting like you're asleep, and you're not going to wake up. I remember with our three kids, there were times, sometimes I got up and I'd bring the baby and I'd hand it to my wife, but there were other times when that baby was screaming, I'm like, I'm just going to pretend like I don't hear it. I'm just going to sleep. I am sleeping so sound. You can't miss a screaming baby. How is your appetite? What is the appetite for God's word? You know, the, you know love the Bible. What is your love like for the word of God, of God. And this is what's going to change. So as newborn babes desire, be hungry for the word of God. But you know what will happen? You may get saved and you'll have an intense hunger for the word of God and you'll begin to study it. You'll begin to read it. You want to go to church again and hear another Bible study. And why did the pastor stop? Why didn't he go longer? You're, you're the baby crying for milk. But as time goes on, you begin to bring other food sources into your life. And what happens when we are eating food before the meal? Well, we're no longer as hungry. We have satisfied the hunger pains, the appetite. And this is, I think, something we have to be on guard against as believers. As young men, as young women, you've got to pay attention the normal thing for a Christian, listen to this, the normal thing for the Christian is to crave the word of God. That's normal. So let's, let's all be honest with ourselves. Where do you line up with normal today? Are you okay to not have the word of God? Can you go days and weeks and months without getting into the word and reading it and studying it? Then there's something wrong. And where I'd encourage you to start is, what are you drinking from? What are the wells are you drawing from? That you're, you're, you're taking it in and it's satiating your desire for, hunger, uh, for, the, for the word of God. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's this thing right here or some kind of media. You're just like constant information coming into your mind. You got it, all this information. It's useless information so often in the time, isn't it? I mean, it's like you said, you know, Squirrels at night in a park. You know, you, just, you, you spend a half an hour watching squirrels in a park. What does that have to do with anything? But we just, we watched it. And now our time is gone. And now we think about getting into the Word. You're like, I'm not interested anymore. I have these other things I've been reading and studying and, and, and paying attention to. So I would say this, first to me and then to you. If I find the Word of God boring then I need to begin to take out all other streams of information that are coming into my life. I can't tell you to do that, and you can't tell her to do that, and he can't tell him to do that. But the Holy Spirit can tell you. So if, you're a, if you are a, a follower, a babe in Christ, and that doesn't mean a newborn, a new Christian, it just means this is the desire you're supposed to have. If you don't have a hunger, you need to be alarmed. I need to be awakened. And I need to ask myself, why? How can I be a Christian and not be hungry for the word of God? Because it tells me here that I am to desire the word as a newborn babe. Listen, it might be media that's stealing your time and your energy and your thoughts for the word of God. It might be an activity. It might be, you know, Josh talked about, you know, Bad teaching and false teaching. Listen, you need, to, you need to be into the word of God. You need to study this and you need to read this, not because I say so, but because the word of God says so. You, I mean, it's in your Bible. Desire the pure milk of the word like a baby. And so I pray that as we go through this next couple of days, there's something that begins to be stirred up within you 
that as you kind of changed your schedule here for the next few days, and some of the things that are coming into your life, they've been stopped. And now what's going to happen? You're just going to have the Word of God coming into your life. Have you ever had uh, somebody say, all right, you know, are you very hungry? And you're like, oh, I'm not so hungry. Maybe you worked real hard that day and your appetite feels suppressed, but then you take that first bite of food and you're like, boom, you're, you're like, I'm really hungry now. And uh, my wife said, I thought you said you weren't hungry. I wasn't until I ate. And now that I've eaten, there's something has awakened within me. And I want more of it. I pray that this is what the word of God does in your heart and in your life today. It says as newborn babes that we are to desire the pure milk of the word. The word of God, your Bible, is pure. It's not deceitful. It's not dishonest. It doesn't have any of the deception that we are told to lay aside. It is good for you. It is pure. The the, the Bible is God's reason and his intelligence expressed to you. Think about that for a second. You can understand God's reasoning, and you can hear the expression of God's intelligence in the pages of the word of God. And that should draw us in. Imagine, it's hard to do this, but imagine we didn't have any Bible, but we knew there was a God out there, and and we wanted to hear from him. And then all of a sudden, you, f- you heard that in your town, miraculously from heaven, this book appeared, and it is the thinking and the reasoning and the intelligence of God, never been on planet Earth before. Can you imagine the way people would flock to that location to read and find out and to hear? Just give me, just, just give me one part of it. And we can grow so cold and callous, but understand what is on your lap. It's the milk that's going to help you grow, but it's the milk that is the reasoning and the intelligence and the revelation of God. And you can dive into this all on your own. You are not dependent upon anybody else. Now, God, thankfully, has given leaders to the church to teach and instruct and to lead. But the Bible also says this is that the Holy Spirit dwells in you and you have no need that anyone should teach you because as you open the Bible and you begin to read this, the Spirit of God who dwells in you is going to inform you of the Word of God. And you can experience Him and you can know Him. Nobody can hold you back. Nobody can hold you back from getting in the Bible on your own. Well, I don't like my pastor. He's this or they're that or he should do more of this or he should do less of that and I'm not learning and I'm not growing. You have a Bible. Pick it up and read it and study it. Love the Bible and watch your country change. This is what happened in our country. (laughs) But I'll tell you, there is fewer and fewer people loving the Bible in America. There are some recent statistics that have come out about our country that are saddening of where the church of America is headed. And it's not that we love the Bible anymore. And so you can pray for America to love the Bible again, too, as you pray for your own heart and life. So we see the same problems. Now, as you keep on moving through this verse, too, so we're to, as newborn babes, desire, right? Intense desire. And then what is it that we're to desire? The pure milk of the word. The pure intellect and reasoning of God and revelation of God is given to us in scriptures. And then the last phrase of verse 2 is that you may grow thereby. There is no other way that you're going to grow other than the word of God coming into your life and, 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 and speaking to those issues of your life, encouraging you and building you up. This is going to make us mature. The word of God will make you mature. I want to, I got a couple of verses I like to, to take you through that speak of what God's word is going to do in your life. We have this general statement that we're going to be mature or we're going to grow, but I want to read some of the specifics that the Word of God says about itself. And when you bring that in, what is it going to do in you? What can you expect to happen in your life? Well, Jeremiah 1, verses 9 and 10 says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I put my words in your mouth. And this is what it's going to do. 
to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. You know what the word of God is going to do in your life? It's going to make you lay aside those filthy garments. As the word of God comes into your life, those things that have been lifted up, that are haughty and prideful and not righteous and not godly, the first thing that's going to happen is those things are going to come down. The Lord will root it up like a good gardener in his vineyard. He's going to take out the weeds. But you know what happens when you tend to garden? It's going to grow better fruit. And then he says to build and to plant. Maybe it's a bad building that's fallen down and there's no way you can do anything. And what needs to happen on that piece of land is that building's got to come down and it's got to be removed so you can put something new and fresh. I have a feeling that some of you, even already, you know exactly what needs to be set aside in your life. You know exactly what's not right. But here's the problem. You're afraid. It's become such a natural part of your life that when that goes, you're afraid of what's going to be left behind. Like, what's going to happen? I mean, if the building comes down, if this sin in my life comes down, then what's going to replace it? Something better. The Lord's going to put a better structure on your life. He's going to put, he's going to put as we mentioned before, those fruits of the Spirit. You don't have to be afraid of what the Lord takes out of your life. But as you get into the Word, you're going to be convicted of things. Another passage in 1 John 2.14, it talks about how the young men overcame Satan, overcame the wicked one. 1 John 2.14. And he tells us that the way they overcame the wicked one, the young men, was because the word of God was abiding in them. They had taken in the word of God and now they were able to be victorious over the flesh and over the tactics and the lies of the enemy. Turn with me to Psalm 19. There are six things that Psalm 19 declares that God's word is going to do in your life and in my life. And every one of these things is exactly what every one of us wants to see happen. So Psalm 19, and we're going to pick up at verse 7. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul or refreshing the soul. What is God's word going to do in your life? It's going to refresh you. It's going to transform you. It's going to change you. If you're looking at your life and say, hey, pastor, I know what you're saying is true, but I just don't see it. I don't see it happening in my life. Well, listen, the Lord can do this. He can change and he can transform you. Um, what else do we read here? Uh, the testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise is simple. Have you ever said, I don't know what to do? Well, guess what happens is you're in the word of God. It's going to give you wisdom to know how to live your life. And it says the statutes of the Lord, verse 8, are right, rejoicing the heart. You know, maybe you're just feeling down and you're feeling sad and you don't feel the joy of the Lord. You know what's going to happen as you get into the Word of God? It's going to bring joy into your life. Who doesn't want to be changed? Who doesn't want to be made wise? Who doesn't want to have their heart rejoiced? We keep on reading here, and it says, The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. God doesn't leave us in the dark. God wants you to have light in your life to know how to live, to know, you know how to interact with people. We also keep on reading that it's going to warn us. And as you read the word of God, there'll be many times that the scripture is going to warn you of something. And so we read there in verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous are uh, altogether. So you're going to be warned. You're going to have this fear uh, that will come into your life, a godly fear. And then we also read that um, there in verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. And so, you know, as you look at this, verse 11, goes on talking about that warning. In verse 12, who can understand his errors, can it cleanse me from his faults? Listen, we need the word of God. Every one of those things needs to happen in our heart, in our life. 
And so I just want, just in these closing few minutes that I have with you, I want to give you an exhortation to pick up your Bible and to read it every day. It's yours. God gave it to you. Nobody's keeping you back from being a great follower of Jesus Christ. By great, I mean a close follower of Jesus Christ. Nobody's keeping you back from that. This is what the Word of God will do in your life. So I encourage you, on, on the back of that, this uh, bookmark, there are four questions with some other questions. And this is what I encourage you to do. If you know how to have a quiet time and you get into the Word every day and it is rich and it is pure and it's overflowing, don't stop what you're doing, okay? But if you're like, I open the Bible and I can't even understand it and it's in my own language. I read this and it's like, it makes no sense to me. I encourage you to do this, is to get a notebook and to get a pen and begin to walk through answering all of these questions. And what you're going to find as you engage your mind prayerfully on the Word of God, and you engage your hand and begin to write things down. What does this passage mean? Restate it in your own words. It's all on the back. You don't have to write this down. What does it, what does it say about God the Father, or the Son, or the Holy Spirit? What is it in that passage? What is it saying about God? Is there a characteristic to note? Is there something that God doesn't like? What does it say about others? So if I'm reading about David out on the battlefield, I see his faith. If I read about Saul who was jealous over David, I read about bitterness. And I, I learn the things I should do and I learn the things I don't do. What does this passage say about me? We looked at a passage that talked about you and me. Lay aside the filthy things. Begin to desire the word of God. And you can just go through and you can write this down. Now at the bottom, you have that little QR code. And I, it'll take you to uh, our church's website. And right at the very bottom of that page, it says, like, uh, uh, how to study the Bible. If you'll click on that, there are some videos that will teach you. Like, if you're like, how do I define a word? How do I find a cross-reference? There's like 30-second videos on how to study the Bible. I'd, it's not the best thing ever, but I tell you what. I was introduced to this, uh, to me, when I was in uh, 11th grade, um, so I was 17 years old, and I have been doing this, and I think like this as I come to the Word of God. So I, I recognize that a lot of people, they love church, they love hearing their pastor teach, they, they love the Bible, but the truth is this, I, I don't get anything out of it when I read it. I know we're not supposed to say that out loud, but that's the reality, and so my encouragement to you is to pray. Say, Lord, fill my mind with your word as I read it. Lord, I want to understand it. And this is what I'll say. If you will commit to, for the next year, I'm going to read the word of God like this. And I'm going to take notes. At the end of that year, you're going to love the Bible more. You're going to be more mature. There's going to be more joy in your life. The sin is going to be pulled down. It's going to be rooted out. You are going to understand the character and the nature of your God more. And people are going to look at your life and you're going to say, what has happened? And you're going to say, I love the Bible. And it changed this part of Africa. And it will change all of Africa. I close with this. I got one minute. Pastors, youth leaders, moms, dads. Older brothers and sisters in Christ. You may say, well, I don't need that. I know how to study. Perfect. Let me ask you this. Do you know how to teach somebody else to study? Because it's one thing to be able to read it on your own, but do you know how to teach somebody else, that new believer? Do you know how to teach them to read the Word of God on their own? Because if you don't, try this out. And so for our men's group, we'll, we'll go through the book of Philippians together. And we're just answering those questions. The women's ministry has done that. The home fellowships, the, uh, the, the middle schoolers, the high schoolers. They've all, we, we do this. We figure this. The best discipleship that we can have and impact a person's life is to teach them how to study their Bible on their own. And in doing that, they're going to grow. And they're going to mature and you're going to have a healthy body. And that is the job of a shepherd, is to feed the sheep and make them healthy. So I pray you find this practical and helpful. Let's, let's ask the Lord. Let's ask the Lord right now to just give us 
a fresh understanding of his word, a fresh love for his word. Father, we thank you that you have given this to us and you've held nothing back. Genesis to Revelation. Lord, you say in the word that you reveal the secrets to your friends and you've given us a whole book. Thank you, Lord, that we have this revelation. And Lord, I pray for, I see so many young men and women here, teenagers. Lord, I pray that their minds would be filled with your word to overflowing. I pray they could pick up and read in Ephesians or in John or anywhere in the Bible and that, Lord, they will encounter you in a fresh and powerful way. Lord, we thank you that you've not left us in the dark. You've given us your Holy Spirit. You've given us your word that is a, a, it's a lamp unto our feet. So, Lord, we want to take advantage of that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.